I wanted to say briefly where this project came from. In 2014, I went to a performance of Schubert's Die Winterreise. William Kentridge, the South African artist, had accompanied the performance with uh, projections of his own work. But the connection between them seemed to me what was so moving about that. So I sort of put that in my memory. And uh, in the next few years, I uh, started taking photographs, many of which I realized contained reflections. Uh, reflections in glass, reflections uh, in water, optical illusions of various kinds, and so on. And so when uh, Francis and I started talking about um, making what we thought of at the time as, um, as a song cycle together, I remembered Schubert's song cycle, and uh, there were these photographs, and I thought, well, what if we, I made a character who was a photographer, and, and she had, has, in the recent past, gone to see Schubert's Stephen Therese, and is, it comes away terribly moved by it, um, because it so happens that she's 31 years old, too, and though she's not dying, she is filled with the same kind of unhappiness um, as Schubert had had. And she realizes as a result of this uh, what it is that has taken the rosiness out of her life. And um, what it is is that she's been trained as um, a woman in the arts uh, to hide her emotions, to um, uh, keep herself out of her artworks, and so not to make available to other people the kind of connection that she made with Schubert. And she decides upon reflection that she's just not going to keep doing things that way. Um, and so we see her at her gallery opening uh, with her photographs on the walls, talking to the guests, and she's explaining all this to them. Um, and uh, inviting them to find her uh, in her work. But this piece has presented a lot of really unique challenges. I mean, first, there is the nature of exactly what it is. It is kind of a cross between a song cycle and an opera. And so there's this kind of interesting pull between the arias as individual entities and then the dramatic whole. Um, then there's the range of elements that go into it, which is kind of large. I mean, there's the images, which are, are very complex, and they suggest kind of a wide range of references and feelings. And of course, then the text, which is not only a commentary on the images, but also sort of brings to life this character of this young artist that we're trying to create. Um, so for my starting point, I would try to imagine her in, interior life, how she felt about her work, and with a particular awareness of her her vulnerability, which I think is something as a creative artist we can all relate to. Because, you know, when you present a piece, you're sort of showing your deepest and most essential self, which is terrifying. <laughs> um, then I would immerse myself in the particular image and try to kind of tease out what it said to me sonically. So, for example, in one aria, which is called Red Pompeii, you'll see, among other things, the images of a goddess and a queen. That sparked in my imagination this thought of like, well, what if that goddess was somewhere far off, maybe far in the distance, singing? And what if that voice was actually the Sherry's voice, the, the photographer's voice? Um, so as if Sherry, as if the photographer is a reflection of this goddess.
another example is a photograph that uh, is of a sculptor's studio. Um, it's filled with representations of women as angels and saints. And the photographer speaks a bit lightly about this, but there's a definite dark side too. The way that the women are represented is to me somewhat disturbing, but by photographing them and by seeing them with a feminine gaze, the photographer is, I think, trying to claim a female agency.
I realized as I was listening, I forgot to mention at the beginning that there is pre-recorded sound in this piece. Um, those low tones that you heard at the end, those are, um, they actual, actually come from the vials. They're processed vial sounds. And those, they serve multiple functions, I think emotionally and sonically, but also a very practical function in the complete piece. And there are particular challenges about writing for these instruments. And the fact of the matter is that the vials need to tune, um, like Lisa, you were saying like every 20 minutes, probably. Um, writing for vials and recorders is really extraordinarily difficult in many ways. A lot of the tricks you fall back on with modern instruments are not going to work with these. So you really have to be at the top of your game. But Parthenia and Sherry have just been so amazingly generous to like read through things for me, critique things, tell me when something doesn't work and how I might make it better. So it's just kind of been a composer's dream to work with these five people. There were times when the recorder had a shakuhachi like sound, hmm? and bending yeah. pitches and I study shakuhachi and everything I do musically is is very much inflected by that. And yeah, that was in my mind with the recorder. But for this particular piece, did you have a concept for how you would integrate the recorder? Um, I felt very strongly that in a way, the recorder has a slightly different relationship with the voice than the vials do. Also, since there's so much uh, reflecting and echoing and doubling and so on that goes on, and, and I was really glad that um, the recorders were there because I think of the recorder and the voice as being sort of analogs to each other in a special way and, and the breath and all that. Um, and so I, I sort of imagined um, Sherry and Larry as being <laughs> kind of um, paired up in this, in this way with uh, the vials doing something else. And from my point of view, the vials play with um, great expressivity and shape. And there, there is a subtle vibrato, um, but the recorder can use as much vibrato as a voice. And there were times when I felt like I was a voice. Do the musicians hear the pre-recorded parts in real time? In live performance, the musicians absolutely will hear everything. In a real performance, you know, the sound is in the air with the instruments and it can sound great, you know, if it's a good space and you've engineered it right. One of the cool things I think about the playing with the pre-recorded sounds is that they feel like part of the sound of the vial consort until the volume comes up to the, to the point or where, until we stop playing and hear it. And that's often how we use each other's sound within the, the concert when there's no electronic sound. So that's a pretty wonderful aspect of, of the electronic track. So essentially in the performance, you will be a sixth performer. I will. I will. Will you be visible? Will you be one of us in a circle with the, with the vials and Sherry? I lean against doing so just because I think, you know, whenever I see things like that to an audience, it's like, why is she reading her email? I mean, like they can't tell what you're doing. So that that's the premise for the piece. And then um, I got invited uh, to be in an exhibition in the um, in the Venice Biennale, and so I wanted to uh, export this work to Venice. Um, and so uh, Francis and I made an excerpt uh, from the opera of about twenty minutes, which becomes the soundtrack for a hologram, uh, in which the soprano. Um, will appear in Venice <laughs> in this room, surrounded by actual photographs on the wall um, and singing uh, the soundtrack, which will appear around her. To make a hologram, you make a video, basically. Um, and what you make a video of in this case was Sherry standing in a space that was entirely black. So there's Sherry uh, standing there and we played um, the soundtrack and she 
uh, lip sync to it and acted. Um, and she, she's marvelous. I mean, she's marvelous to look at. I, one thing I forgot to say at the beginning is our listeners should uh, write any questions in the Q&A. Could you reflect on how you have moved from your deeply considered critical writings to a complex art form that you have yourself? Oh, goodness. You <laughs> That's <a> fabulous. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful question. In fact, I mean, I um, there's nothing more uh, consistent than what I'm thinking I'm saying in this um, piece and what I've been writing for the last God knows how many decades um, in, in terms of my theories, that um, the just as with the Kentridge Schubert uh, connection what, at, or the, the young photographer and Schubert, um, what we value about art is our uh, response to something to be sure but it's a response that shows us responding, that shows us something interesting about our response to ourselves. And so there's all this interactivity involved in looking at art and self-knowledge that arises to know your emotions and to know the things that move you, the deep things that move you. And sometimes you, you don't know them until you have an experience with art that makes you feel that way. So that's what that photographer discovered at a very young age. It took me much longer than <laughs> 31 to, to learn all that. Um, and her invitation to, the, um, to, to her viewers to find her in her work is what we all, we all send out when we make art or perform art. It's all the, the same kind of thing. It's sort of know me, know me but know me by responding to something that I've made or I love or I care about. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> wow. 